345 session, educational session. This session is sponsored by Beef, the Beef Master Educational Endowment Foundation. Um, and today we've got a speaker with us, Dr. Robert Wells from the Noble Research Institute. Um, and today, Dr. Wells will be talking to us about using EPDs and how to use EPDs to add profit to your herd. Dr. Wells currently serves as a, li as a livestock consultant and producer relations at the Noble Research Institute. He joined the consultation team in 2005, and his areas of emphasis include forage-based beef cattle production, cow-calf nutrition, herd health programs, improving herd genetics, and value-added calf programs. He's also the executive director for the Integrity Beef Alliance, which he'll tell us a little bit about and most of y'all have heard about uh, through throughout the last year or so. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Wells. Can you all hear me okay with this mic? All right. Well, I appreciate y'all uh, taking time to, or allowing me to take time out of y'all's uh, conference to be here. I think Geraldine's telling me that I need to be over here a little bit. So uh, I walk around a little bit when I do my presentation, so I apologize on that. But, but anyways, I appreciate uh, y'all taking time out of your schedule to let me visit with y'all a little bit. Uh, I know y'all have got a busy uh, conference, and I, I want to respect y'all's time on that. Uh, but uh, anyways, what they asked me to talk with y'all a little bit about is just EPDs, understanding them and using them. And so we're going to walk through how we can use EPDs as a selection guide. Uh, I know there's a, 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 a undertow, not just with commercial people, but also with those folks that are in the registered business on you know, whether or not EPDs are, are truly accurate. Some people seem to think it's a black box and there's a little bit of voodoo magic or something that goes into developing EPD scores. But uh, there's, there's not. It's a lot of science that goes into it. There's a lot of, a lot of math, a lot of algorithms. Uh, but it is a, a very usable tool. It's just that. It is a tool. It's not the end all. It is a part of our selection tool. And it's an, what I call an aid uh, for us to be able to select which animals we're going to use in our program, uh, but it's not the only thing that we use. It's part of our tool that's in our toolbox that we have available. So we're going to discuss EPDs a little bit. First off, I, uh, talking to a, a group of purebred breeders, I think that uh, I wouldn't do y'all justice if we didn't talk about accuracies a little bit. So we're going to start off talking about accuracies. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how can we use DNA in our programs to enhance what we're doing with our EPDs and to reinforce and fortify that and I'll tell you from a, a, a commercial cowman's perspective, we'll talk about how much that means to that commercial guy to be able to have that confidence of having a higher accuracy for that producer. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about carcass traits and performance traits, and I'm going to give you some real-world numbers on that. Uh, the carcass traits won't be from Beefmaster, but they'll be from a producer that I'm working with uh, that's in one of those black-hided breeds. Uh, but I think it's a good example of what can be done and how we can use those EPDs to enhance our breeds as we move forward. Uh, the performance traits, we're, that's going to be from real world numbers. Uh, that, as, uh, as Lance said, that's going to be from our Integrity Beef Alliance, and we'll, we'll visit a little bit about that. But it's a good set of numbers that will reflect how, when we use EPDs, the value of what we can do with that, having that information. And then I want to address y'all's uh, index values a little bit, and then maybe direction of where y'all need to be moving into the future uh, with. Uh, thinking about other EPDs that you might add on to your suite that you already have. Uh, so it's my, my presentation at the beginning is supposed to be informative. At the end, I want y'all to be thinking about it, and hopefully y'all don't uh, escort me out by my ear. Uh, but I want y'all to, it, it, at the end of it's designed to hopefully make y'all think a little bit and question as you move forward as a, as a, as a breed. <coughs> so, uh, you know, what is an EPD? Uh, you know, we all know it's an expected progeny difference. Basically, it's that estimate of how the future progeny of that animal is expected to perform relative to the others that are listed in the index or in that EPD characteristic in the database. So it's that tool to be able to allow us to have that predictability. And any of y'all that know me, that know when I work with a commercial producer as a consultant, I've been doing consultant work for over 14 years now. Uh, when I work with those producers, I really do try to push that a producer uses a registered bull that has EPDs because that allows us to have that predictability. If it's a small guy that only has one bull, that's not as bad. It's, it's not as important, but it, it still is. 
uh, the reason I say it's not, but it is, it sounds like I'm talking out both sides of my mouth, is it's, it's not as important because you know, one bull is going to contribute half the genetics to the entire calf crop. So in that regard, uniformity takes care of itself because we only have one bull contributing half the genetics. But the other side of it is, the reason I say it is important on having those EPDs, we'd be, we need to be able to have a realistic expectation of how is that bull going to perform. Not only if we're talking about cavities or birth weight but, or weaning weight or urine weight, but we need to be able to know how is that calf going to perform on the rail because that calf is going to leave your ranch at some point in time. He's going to end up being somebody else's animal. He's going to go to a feedlot. He's got to perform on the feedlot basis. So that means he's got to gain and he's got to be able to eat and he's got to be able to convert. And we don't want to have an animal that eats him out of house and home and doesn't gain and doesn't have good conversions because what will happen is if he comes back to buy cattle from you again, he's going to discount the heck out of them because he's going to make it where those calves are going to be profitable for him the next time around. But also, somebody's going to own that animal when he hangs on the rail. If that's the feedlot or if it's the packer, and the still, that animal has to be profitable. So we got to think about the big picture of how is that animal going to be profitable all the way through the industry. Because we're in the industry where, on the cow-calf level, we're price takers. We don't get to assign the price that we want to sell that animal for. But at the same time, a rising tide floats all ships. So if I sell my animal to the next guy, if he's profitable with that animal, then that gives him a little bit more money to be able to send it back down the, the chain to the cow-calf producer the next time. If he's not profitable, that's why we worry so much about is the feedlot industry, are they in the red or the black? Because the feedlot, if they're in the red, they don't have the money to put down on the next turn of cattle, and that means they're going to tighten up their belts on their bids to the cow-calf producer. And ultimately, that trickles down to y'all as purebred or, or uh, registered breeders on the fact that if you want to sell a registered animal to them, they've got to be, that cow-calf commercial producer has to be profitable. Because if he's not, he doesn't have that money to put out toward buying your bulls or your cows. So it, it's, it is a rising tide floats all ships. And that's why I think the EPDs are so valuable. So why should we use EPDs? Well, it's because they are not all things are as they seem. We can have an animal that we look at them and we think, oh, he ought to be calving eats. Now, let me ask you a question, since we've got a national audience here. I want to find out, is this just an Oklahoma oddity, because I've never heard of it before I moved to Oklahoma, or is it something more on a national basis? Never before, until I moved to Oklahoma, had I ever heard anybody say that one of the things they pick on their bulls to make sure he's cavities is the size of the bull's head. Anybody else heard that? The size of the bull's head. Oh, well, he's got a small head, so the calves ought to come easy. Okay, do y'all collect EPDs on circumference of the head? No, because that doesn't count. It has no meaning to it. Realistically, after the feet come out, what is the next anatomical part of the head or the body that comes out, and what is the next smallest size? The head. If that head is what's stopping that animal, man, we got a buffalo. But honestly, there's a lot of people I've run into that they use those type of phenotypic measurements as their buying criteria. So that animal that had that small head might have a set of shoulders on him that looks like a buffalo. And he might not be easy calving. Likewise, he could be smooth fronted, but long as a well rope, and maybe he's got big hips. And he might be smooth fronted, long as a well rope, and he's put together right, but he's still conveys a big birth weight. So you can't measure phenotype and expect that phenotype to be able to transmit a perception every time. <coughs> the phenotypes that we do measure, we've measured them because we have reliability and accuracy in that, in those, those traits. So here's another reason why to use EPDs over individual traits. You might recognize a big ugly guy on your left. That's your speaker, yours truly. Now those are my two sisters and we're all full, full sibs have the same mom and dad. Our birth weights were relatively similar. Obviously, we didn't grow out the same. Now, obviously, and I've measured this, I was the last one to become a confirmed sire in our family to go in our pedigree book. And when we looked at the birth weights that we transmitted EPD-wise to our offspring, we didn't have the same birth weights. 
which one would you say would have the smallest birth weight of these three? Did you know it was me? I compared the smallest birth weights to my children compared to my two sisters. Now, I say that, you know, just to be a little fun, but what it means, what I mean by that is individuals of the same actual values will perform differently. And that's why we use EPDs, because if we use those actual values, it can lead us astray, because there's not a lot of strength in one data point. When we use EPDs, we have not just one data point, we have data points on that individual, we have on his siblings, we have on the mom and the dad, the, the sire and the dam, the grandsires and granddams, half sibs, three quarter sibs, cousins, so on. And we take all those individual points and we put them together and that confers a lot of strength to be able to, make, to have that EPD. And I don't know all the science, I don't know the algorithm that goes into developing every EPD, but I trust that, that those, those algorithms are correct. And there's been a lot of thought by a lot of people smarter than me in the genetic world that's developed those EPDs. <coughs> The other thing is that environmental exposure management can override genetics. So this is my oldest sister and this is my middle sister. What I tell everybody, I joke around with my oldest sister and I say, you know, mom and dad were practicing on being a mom and dad. They didn't know how to feed you, so you just stunted you a little bit because you didn't grow out as well as you could have to your genetic potential. I said, they got a little better with my middle sister. They learned how to feed her a little better. She turned out a little taller. She's about 5'9". And with me, they figured it out. And they fed me to my, my genetic potential, and that's why I'm so much taller than them. But that environmental exposure can override genetic potential. EPDs are designed to be able to take some of that into account because of the fact that we've got so many data points over time that we'll, we can get to that average. And it's a stronger estimate of predictability than that individual trait is. So what I tell my producers when I start working with them on a com uh, one of my commercial producers, is I tell them that EPDs, in my opinion, are a judging class on paper. It's where I start the selection process. Because if I go to a large cell that has several hundred, maybe four or five hundred head at that cell, I don't have the time to walk the pens and look at every individual bull and write down notes on them and remember every individual bull and then be able to make a, a buying decision based upon an economic value that I put on that bull with three or four or five hundred head. Nor should I need to, even though there's four hundred head or two hundred or even a hundred head at that cell. I probably only need to be looking at a very small subset of that based upon what are the, the goals of that producer I'm working for. If he's maternal in nature, then we're going to look at those traits that are important to develop replacements. If he's terminal in nature, then I'm not going to look at a lot of those maternal traits because they don't matter. That animal's going to go to the feedlot and get his head cut off at some point in time but I'm gonna look at those animals and those traits that are terminal in nature. And so because of that, I'm not gonna look at every animal. And it allows me to be able to utilize my time more effectively and be able to spend more time with each individual animal once I get to the cell and I can evaluate that animal more critically rather than running through the pens because I've only got half a day to look at 100 eggs. I can more effectively spend my time to take that half day and look at 20 heads. And also I can use that to build, build that relationship with my producer and teach him what is it that I'm looking for. Not just from a numerical standpoint, but phenotypically. And make sure that that bull has got a, a disposition that is gonna be something that that producer is willing to deal with. Instead of running through, if I run through that, that group of bulls, I may not catch that bull is sitting off to the back. And the reason he was in the back was because he's kind of high headed and he wants to be out of that pen and be in the next pen over. <coughs> So it's my judging class on paper. So how do we develop EPs? Well, we gotta have a contemporary group. You all know this. Uh, what is a contemporary group? A contemporary group is a group of animals that is given the exact same opportunity to perform. So we take out that variation of management. We take out that year-to-year -year variation of environment, those feed effects, all those different effects that are, that are variable, we take those out and remove them because all the animals have been exposed to the exact same management, the exact same feed, the exact same weather at the same time. And that's how we develop those contemporary groups. And they're in the exact same location. <clears throat> One thing I will say is I was just talking to a purebred breeder yesterday from another breed, and he said that one of the things that he's noticed is sometimes he gets some volatility in his EPDs. And he asked me, why do I think that? 
one of his comments was, or one of the things I asked him, I said, I'm going to call him Joe. I said, Joe, I said, how often are you AI or embryo transfer anymore? He said, well, you know, I'm getting a little older. I'm slowing down. He said, I've got a good set of bulls. I spend the money on my bulls. I just let them do it. Thing is, I said, you need to be using some widely recognized, you know, preferably some AI sires, to be able to have that good reference base in your, in your contemporary group. If you're just using your, your natural bulls that you produced on your operation, then the data set that goes to calculate those EPDs is relatively small. When you sell those bulls to somebody else and he starts using those bulls on a different set of animals, then that can dramatically impact those EPDs and move those EPDs rapidly in one direction or another. But by having those reference sires in there, and preferably using reference sires that are widely accepted and used in the industry, I, my personal opinion is I think you'll help reduce some of that volatility. So let's talk about accuracy. What is accuracy or possible change? The numbers I'm going to use here are the 2017 numbers. I was talking to Lance. <coughs> Uh, it doesn't have the 2018 possible change tables up on the website yet, so I use the 2017 possible change. But I wouldn't expect there to be much difference uh, between the 2017 and 2018 possible change tables that are on your website. But when we think about possible change, usually those numbers are going to run in from a 0 to a 1, or if they're expressed on a percent basis, which I think uh, uh, Beefmaster does express it, it'll be on a 0 to 100 percent. So you think about a 0, a 0 is low accuracy, a 1 or a 100 is going to be high accuracy. So a 100 is going to be hitting the bullseye. That's going to be every time I breed this bull to this cow and I have 100% accuracy, I know without a doubt this is what my calf is going to be. Now realistically, very few animals have that high of accuracy. It's got to be a widely used, heavily industry accepted AI sire to have that kind of accuracy. <coughs> but it's very easy to have an accuracy in a bull that's in that 50, 60, 70 percent range really easily and we should be using to think about those animals. So how does accuracy impact our EPDs? So this is something that I find that there's a lot of most co commercial producers don't understand it and I find that a lot of purebred or registered producers don't understand this either so that's why I want to take time to visit about it. If we take two bulls and we'll take bull A and B, we're going to do a head-to-head -head comparison here. And we're going to use birth weight as our example. They both bulls have a birth weight EPD of 0.7. So that's breed average is what I intended from 2018 data, 0.7 birth weight. And if we use accuracy of this one bull, we say he's got 10% accuracy. So he's a young virgin bull, doesn't have much information collected yet. And we use a bull that's a, got a 90% accuracy. So he's a widely used AI type sire that has got a lot of data points behind his EPD. How does that translate? So if we look at our possible change tables, and as a show of hands, how many of y'all have ever taken the time to look at your possible change tables for beef master? I would encourage you to do that. Go home and look at your herd sire. Pull his information up on the website if you don't have a current set of his, his papers. Look at his EPD. Look at the accuracy. That accuracy will be the next number underneath that EPD. And look where that accuracy lands that animal. Then go to look at your possible change table. <coughs> And let's, let's say his accuracy was a 0.1 or 10%, like our bull A in this example. For birth weight, we have a possible movement of 2.2 pounds, plus or minus around what his EPD is. For that bull B, who is at 90% accuracy, we have a possible change of 0.24, around that 0.7. So let's run those numbers and see where it lands. So if we take bull A and bull B, we can make him whatever color we want. He can be purple, he can be black, he can be yellow, whatever color. Take that 0.7, so he's breed average, 10% accuracy. So he's got that possible change around that, that 0.7 EPD of plus or minus 2.19. His range that he has the ability to have is negative 1.9 birth weight. Actually, I should say birth weight there, not, birth, not cavities. So it could be a negative 1.9 birth weight or it can be as high as a 2.81. If we take those EPDs and we translate that over to the percentile table, that bull has the range percentile of 10% to 95th percentile. So that low accuracy bull, even though he was breed average on his EPDs, really can be anything. And realistically, when, before the dust settles, I mean, he's going to be somewhere between 10 and 95th percentile. 
with the same EPD of 0.7 for weaning birth weight. His possible change of 0.24, the range is going to make him a, a 0.46 or 0.94. So we're just adding or subtracting this 0.24 from that 0.7 that we start with. So the possible, the percentile probability range for that bull is 0.45 or 45th percentile to 60th percentile. So which bull would you want to use, let's say on conversion heifers? B. Because that bull is going to give us a lot more predictability that his birth weight is going to be somewhere that is acceptable to put on a virgin heifer. Now, how many times have you had a producer that's bought a bull from you, a young virgin bull, and they put them on heifers, let's say, or they put them on a young set of cows, <coughs> and they come back and they say, you know what, I had some cabin problems. Well, this could explain why you had cabin problems. You know, the paperwork, the EPD says, well, this is where they're at, but it's a young bull that didn't have a lot of information behind him. If we use breed lines, cow families and bull lines, that have a more history, those foundation type animals, you're gonna have a higher accuracy level in those animals faster because they've got a longer, deeper pedigree that is enabled to add to that accuracy. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about DNA. Now when I talk to a lot of our commercial cattlemen, they think that when we talk about DNA, I think this is, I get a, a, a lot of times they either get a blank look in, my, in their face or I get a horrified look. And that horrified look is I think that they think that we're manipulating the genes and that we're going to make animals that have that can fly and be Pegasus or something. I don't know. But realistically, let's go back to this example of myself and my siblings. Why should we use DNA? What can DNA bring to the table? Well, we're all full sibs, as I said a while ago. I said, we don't look the same. We don't perform the same. I wasn't an athlete. She was an athlete. And she was an athlete. The only reason I wasn't an athlete is I had some physical problems, some leg structure issues. Flush mates will have genet different genetic potential. Even though they're 100% biologically out of the same animals, flush mates can have different genetic potential. Unless they're identical twins, then if they're identical twins, then they're carrying the exact same DNA, the exact same chromosomes, and the, the exact same genes are flipped on in both individuals. But if they're not identical twins, they would just happen to be conceived on the same day in the same uterus at the same time, but by two different sperm cells and two different ova. They just happen to get bred at the same time, then they can have different genetic potential. And remember, half that genetic potential is going to come from the sire and half that genetic potential comes from the dam, and not all the genes are going to be transmitted or, or transferred at the same time. And if they are, not all the genes are flipped on. Remember that you know, we're a complicated biological organism, livestock or humans. <coughs> Every trait out there is seldom able to identify one gene that controls that trait. It's usually a combination of genes either being turned on or turned off that gives us our resulting trait of a high weaning weight or a low birth weight, cavities or high milking ability, any of those hair coat color. So by using DNA, what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to increase the accuracy of our EPDs that we've already developed. Because an EPD is a measure of what we can do genetically, but also what can we do from an environmental standpoint. DNA is a measure of what we can do from a genetic standpoint without regard to the environmental effects that we're going to put on that animal. So using enhanced EPDs, we're going to use those genomic results to increase that accuracy of the EPD because now instead of having environmental effects that can influence how that animal performs, we're looking just solely at the genetics. So it's kind of like, how many of y'all remember those Mustangs in the 1980s? That's when I was, learned how to drive was in the 80s, so I just dated myself. Older than some of y'all, younger than some of y'all. <coughs> but you could buy that Mustang and they all looked the same. You didn't know, back then we called them, you know, they had the 5.0s, we called them the 5 point slows. And then they had the four cylinders. Until you popped the hood, you didn't know which was under the hood. They all looked the same. Well, that's the same with an animal. Until we get under the hive, we really don't know what we've got. Do we have that eight cylinder sports car or do we have that economy four cylinder? Until we get under the hide, we really don't know that. And that's what the EPDs are gonna allow us to do. We calculate those EPDs using genetic correlations or what we call GCs. 
And what that is, is that's a percent of the additive genetic variant that's accounted for in that test, or the geneticists call that the GC squared. Well, I'm not gonna get bogged down into how we go and calculate that, but think about the more genetic variants or the higher the GC square, the more impact that we'll have on that EPD and the accuracy of that EPD. So the more reliable that estimate now becomes. So that's as deep as I'm gonna get into the genetics because I'm not a genetic expert. But one of the things I want you to think about is when we continue, I want y'all to continue to use EPDs for our selection decisions, but we also need to think about that DNA can explain for about 60, 40 to 60% of the total variation of an animal from animal to animal, I should say. A DNA that's enhanced, or, or DNA enhanced EPDs and those accuracies account for a lot more short sources of variation. And they're coming from all information sources. So our pedigree, our physiological environment, and the genomic environment, and the genomics that we put in that animal. So that in DNA enhanced EPD allows us to be able to really account for all the factors that went into that animal and why that animal performs like he does. So all aspects of it. So we get both sides of the, of the world at the best of both worlds. So in my opinion, and this is Robert's opinion, using both DNA and DNA enhanced DPDs is redundant in a cell catalog. I go to a lot of cells over the course of the year. And in my opinion, we get our commercial cattlemen in a situation that we put them in a disadvantage. And I call it information paralysis. And what I mean by that is when you've got a set of EPDs there, that are enhanced by DNA, we've already accounted for that DNA information by having that in the EPD. And then what do we do? We go and put another row down there below it that lists all that EPD information. So now we've got a producer that's trying to figure out something that he doesn't understand, those EPDs, and he really doesn't understand DNA. And then they're trying to figure out, okay, for this trait, is a one or a 10 better? They don't know. <coughs> let alone the fact that we've just added a whole nother set of data that they really don't need to pay attention to because it's already built into that EPD, that enhanced EPD. So what I, when I work with the, the purebred producers, and those, re, those registered producers, I tell them, use your DNA enhanced EPD, put that information there. If you wanna do anything, put the little logo, if it's HD50K or if it's the ultra high, de the, uh, can't remember the uh, gene seeks, acronym for it, uh, but you know, put that on that lot or put it in the, make it prominent in the front page of your catalog. But you don't need to put both in separate information. There. Sally Northcutt, who used to be with Angus and is now has her own company called Molecular Genetics, uh, basically she stated it one of the best I've seen, which is genomics are a result of, a, or genomic results are the way to enhance current selection tools to achieve more accuracy on, pet, on predictions of younger animals. And we can characterize those genetics for traits where it's difficult to measure that phenotype. So an example, another breed uses docility. Now how rank is that animal? Well, my, my level, my threshold of what I consider a rank animal is probably different than yours, James, and probably different from yours. There's no standard that we can set for docility unless, we, unless everybody's gonna put a starter camera on their shoot and have another camera outside of that shoot and measure exit speeds of the shoot. There's a way we can quantify that. But nobody, not everybody's gonna do that. And I wouldn't recommend that. So that's an example of it's a subjective measurement. But through DNA, we can take a subjective measurement and we can quantify it in a numerical value that is consistent and that can be applied from one animal to the next, from one part of the country to the next, with little regard to how an individual would, would rank that. <clears throat> Another example would be body condition score. The way I body condition score an animal is going to be different than somebody else. We might come out with an average that's pretty close, but we're going to be different uh, from an individual to individual basis. So if we use DNA enhanced EPDs, what does that mean on accuracy? Well, the analogy that I use for folks, especially most of our guys that hunt, can understand this. If I've got a deer way back here and I want to shoot him with iron sights, how accurate am I if that deer is 300 yards away? Now, my grandpa could have made that shot. I'm not that good of a shot. I've got to have assistance of optics, having a scope on that. And that's the accuracy that we can, that we can achieve with having that DNA enhanced 
EPD is it allows us to have a greater degree of accuracy and a greater we can hone in and focus in on that object that was 300 yards away and now I can make that shot and make the kill shot. And that's an example I use to be able to express how a DNA enhanced EPD can work for, for cattlemen. <coughs> So a DNA enhanced EPD <coughs> is like getting one to two calf crops of information before that first calf is ever born out of that bull or that heifer. <coughs> and that's valuable. If we just use EPDs and we're looking at carcass characteristics, how many years do we have to wait before we can get carcass characteristics on a young bull? First off, we had to let him get born, raise him up, then he's going to be a two-year-old before he gets to mate with his first cows, maybe a year and a half. And then we're going to have to let that calf gestate. And then it's got to get born. And then it's got to reach 16 to 18 months of age before we harvest that calf. So that bull now is what? Four? Five? Before we ever get any carcass information on him. And that bull might be a bull that consistently gives us a select carcass. And we put all that time and all that money and we've bred all those cows to that bull to find out maybe he's not what we need. And that's an extreme example because carcass information takes the longest amount of time to collect. But wouldn't it be nice when we have the ability that when that calf is born, we can pull a little hair sample, a little tissue sample, a little blood sample, and we can send it off to the lab and we now know what is his genetic potential to be able to grow out. What type of cavities is he going to have? What is the milking ability? And what is his carcass strength going to be? So we can get that first one or two calf crops of information while he's still a calf himself. And we can decide right then, does that bull need to retain his testicles or should he go into the feedlot? And unfortunately, there's a lot of bulls out there and a lot of females that I'll call rescue animals. That, and the reason I call them rescue animals is because somebody rescued it and put it out on pasture when that animal really should have been destined for the feedlot. With having that DNA information, we can, we can eliminate those rescue animals. And a rising tide floats all ships, as I said earlier. As we elevate all of our genetics in our herd, we get a better opportunity to have a better industry. <coughs> so, for those of y'all that were at Justin's presentation this morning, he talked about heritability and, and, and the ability to be able to move a trait one way or another. <coughs> and one of the things he said was, Carcass characteristics are highly variable. I hadn't talked to him. I didn't know he was going to present that, but I'm glad he did because it was a primer. Carcass characteristics are highly desirable. So we're able to move carcass characteristics pretty fast in the industry. And I've got this slide that really shows that. So for those of y'all that are longer in the tooth, that can remember 1975. I was four years old at the time, so I was involved in the cattle industry back then. My, my great uncle had given me some calves that were mine in name, but I didn't manage them. Those of y'all that are a little longer in tooth, look where we were at. If we look at the orange line is choice, the green line is choice and above cattle, the blue line is prime, and our white line is our select cattle. So we were doing as an industry pretty darn good until the mid 80s. And then what happened there? All of a sudden our select started coming up. So why was that? Anybody have an idea? Think back to the breed types that were there. Start introducing a little bit more continental influence in there is my thought. But this year, 2018, up until the last USDA market report, which was last week, we're producing about 7.7% prime, 73.8% choice, which gives us about an 81.5% choice or better cattle. So those are cattle that are either hitting the mark or receiving a premium for the industry. So we're doing pretty good. That's a lot better than we were doing when I was in college back in these years, and we weren't doing so good. So I say that because I want y'all to think about where y'all's cattle are measuring today. If we look at yield grade before we move to y'all's cattle, we look at yield grade, so this is looking at the blue line is yield grade one, the white is yield grade threes, and the green is yield grade twos. So we've kind of been all over the board, but we can see over time our yield grade threes have, have started in the last five or six years, trending up a little bit. Yield grade ones are still going down a little bit, and our twos have gone down, and we started to pick up a little bit there, right here at the end. Remember, yield grade ones and twos, we receive premiums. Three is our par when we're selling on a grid basis. A yield grade four and a five, we receive discounts. 
So we really, that's why I only put yield grade one, twos, and threes, because those are the ones that we can make money on or at least hit the, the grid average. If we look at the average or we look at the trends, 1976 to 2018, and we look at yield grade ones and twos, and then one, twos, and threes. Like I said, those are the ones we can make money at. Yield grade ones and twos, we receive premiums. One, twos, and threes, we're getting a premium or at least hitting the average. <coughs> the red line is one, twos, and threes. We've been doing almost 90% recently, but back in the mid-90s, we were almost 100% ones and twos and threes. Very few fours and very few fives. As time has trick trickled on, we've gotten where we're going to have less premiums associated here. But look at marbling trends. And this is one of those slides that I intended for you all to think about a little bit and maybe go home and question yourselves. So over time, I go back to 2000 on this, this chart. Because that's about back as far as I could go on finding EPD information or information that I had in my personal files. So the blue line is Beefmaster. The red line or orange line is Angus. The green line is Charlet. And the orange dotted line is going to be Herpy. What I want you to look at, and don't, don't try to compare on a relative scale, because all of y'all's traits are not based on the same scale. So you've got to remember there's a crossbreed EPD calculations that we can use to adjust. So don't look at this on a relative level. But what I want you to look at, though, is look at the trends. Look how fast other breeds, your competition, are improving their carcass characteristics relative to what y'all have done. So Angus has shot up here in the last few years. Now, in my opinion, there's some things that they've, in, in doing that rapid expansion on quality grade, they've left some things in the, you know, they've kind of thrown out the baby with the bathwater in some regards that they need to pay attention to. And I would say that if I was at their convention next week. But Beefmaster, y'all have increased, but y'all have not increased at the same increasing rate that your competition has. Now, we're still in the business of selling pounds of beef coming off the ranch. We are price takers. But there's also a perception of the buyer that we have to take into account. And the perceptions are a lot of times based in reality. And so when a buyer understands what are the genetics that's in that commercial calf that's going to town, and we tell them that it's got a lot of beef master genetics in there, they're going to look at it and say, okay, well, they haven't done a whole lot in the last decade to improve their quality grades. And that's, that's a perception that's based in reality. So that's something that maybe it needs to have a little bit of focus on. And the nice thing is, is that's a characteristic that we can have a dramatic impact on if you have a concerted effort on paying attention, a little bit more attention to that trait. Because it, carcass characteristics are some of the most highly heritable characteristics that we have. This is a producer I'm working with. Now this is, I will tell you, it's an Angus-based producer that I'm working with. I wish I could take credit for this increase in quality grade. I just started working with him in the last year. So he'd already figured this out before he got to me. <coughs> I'm working with him on some other aspects, on tweaking some things, but it's a great data set that I wanted to show y'all. So in 2017, he was taking about 18 months to harvest the calves. He was hitting about 13% prime, which is double the national average today, and was way above the national average in 20, in, back in 2007. So he was already doing a pretty good job by anybody's measure, but he said he's not, he wasn't content with that. So in 2012, he started using DNA information and wanted to, to improve his cattle. This is about a 600 head operation. So he's got the size to do these things. So 2014 was the first calf crop that he had. This is the year that that calf uh, crop was, was uh, slaughtered, I should say. I call it calf crop year, but that's the year the animal was slaughtered. It took him 16 months to reach harvest, and he was about 55% prime. Now, of course, it's going to bounce around in here. Here in 2015, he had two different sets of calves, 15 months and 16 and a half months. He was graded 46 and 56% prime between the two of them. <coughs> 2016, didn't do quite as good a job, about 35% prime, but 2016 had some other issues going on. 2017, the last calf crop, it took him 17 months to finish those calves, and he hit 65% prime. That's phenomenal. And I guarantee you, I, I asked him for the choice data, I haven't gotten that, but I guarantee you that he probably had just a few calves that didn't create choice or better probably only had a few calves that were select or no rolls for whatever reason. So most of our commercial producers, if they hit 65% choice, 
they would think that they were doing a good job. He did this through genetic selection, using DNA information, and using that to select for those individuals that would, that would meet those criteria and continue to push the envelope. Now, when he came in and sat down with my office visit, I'll tell you, I thought, man, okay, this was the first information he showed me. I said, all right, yeah, but what'd you do to your fertility? What'd you do to your dry matter intake? What'd you do to these things? He did not single trait select. He looked, at, he, he looked at all aspects of it. He breeds in a 45-day breeding season. So he put selection pressure not only on carcass, but he kept his selection pressure on his reproduction. So he's, he's in 600 head herd calves or breeds within 45 days or it doesn't count his operation. And I told him one thing he could probably do in that situation was, hey, leave the bulls out there for 60 or 75 days. Those calves that get bred at that tail end of your season are going to be better calves than what most people in the industry have. Sell those heifers to somebody else. Allow them to become rescue heifers, so to speak, and let them go to somebody else. But even though they don't fit his operation, they're still better heifers than probably most people can produce. But this is an example of, of using DNA and putting a concerted effort into selection criteria. You can move a set of animals pretty rapidly. And like I said, Carcass characteristics allow that. Performance traits are moderately heritable. Carcass traits are highly heritable. Performance are moderately. Reproductive traits have the lowest heritability. You all have already addressed reproductive traits through heterosis, through that three breed combination that makes up the beef masters. You all have already addressed that. So you all have, should have, good performance or reproductive characteristics. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So as as my introduction said that I'm the executive director for our Integrity Beef Alliance, and I'm not here to promote the alliance, but I want to use some real world data out of it because I have 100% confidence in the data because I was involved in collecting that data from our producers. If we look at the national average, the USDA National Animal Health Monitoring System, that's the average across the United States, 529 pounds, steers and heifers wean weight. On average, our cattle will wean off at 592 pounds, and that's at about 180 to 200 days of age for those calves. So we're not even getting to the 210, 205 day weights. We are getting about a 63 pound increase over the national average of steers and heifers. Um, it's not uncommon for me to get feedback from producers over a 75 pound increase in what they were doing. I had one producer who had solely concentrated on Cavanese direct when he started in this program. And the problem was, is he was getting calves that were hitting the ground weighing 50 pounds. And they weren't growing out very well after that. And he got a, when he got to weaning weights, so and once he converted his bull battery over to what the requirements of our integrity beef alliance are, he saw 150 pound, almost 150, like 146 pound, uh, 146 pound increase in weaning weights by starting to pay attention to his performance characteristics. But if we just take 63 pounds over five years, the average 25 head herd, that's about a 7,800, 7,800, 7,900 pound increase in weaning weight. And all we did was start selecting for a better bull. So here's an example. If we take bull number one, which is just that kind of average run-of-the-mill bull that our neighbor produces that we can buy pretty cheap. We're going to say we buy him for $2,500. Uh, we get him from the neighbor. He don't ha doesn't have any EPDs. We don't have any performance information. And we don't have any what I call reliable ancestral history. It's just anecdotal. Well, you know, his mama did good. And I think I know who his mom was, but I really don't. How many of you all have ever done that or seen, heard that? And every now and then, just if I want to be ornery, I'll go out and I'll uh, look in the local classifieds or go to Craigslist, and I'll look for replacement heifers. And I guarantee you, you go look for that, and you'll always see somebody that says, bred to LBW bulls. This is a little side note. What's LBW? Low birth weight bulls. If you want to be ornery, call them up and challenge them on that. Ask them, how can you prove that? Most of them, it's that bull that was the last time that there was any papers on that bull was several generations back. Run through the math and the numbers with them and show them that that low birth weight bull that they're claiming is low birth weight might not only have but maybe 6% or 12.5% if it's one eighth of the animal if his genetics are attributed to a paper bull years back. It makes them think about it. So every now and then I do that just to be fun. So back to this bull number one. So we buy him for $2,500. Let's say his salvage weight, when we go ahead and have to send him to town, he salvages 1,850 pounds. And we're going to say the salvage price is 80 cents. Now, I can guarantee you right now, anybody in this room would love to get 80 cents a pound. But don't get bogged down in that number because it's all a relative scale. If it's 80 cents or $1.20 or if it's 
40 cents or 25 cents. It's all a magnitude of scale. Both bulls are going to sell at the same relative price when it comes to the end of their life. But the salvage value of that bull in this example is about $1,465. We improve, in, include about a 1% death loss because I work with a bunch of economists and they like to account for everything. So I put that in there. The five-year cost of that bull spread out over five years is about, on an annual basis, about $207 is what his cost is based upon his purchase price subtracting out his salvage value. What is it going to cost me to keep that bull around on an annual basis just on purchase costs? But like I said, I work with a bunch of economists that like to account for a bunch of things. So we'll take that $207. Now let's add in the what's it cost to keep that bull around on an annual basis. And let's say it's $400. The total cash price, we're going to take that $207 plus $400, that gives us $606.96. We're going to spread that over 25 cows. And let's assume we get 100% breed up. We know that's not true, but let's just say we're going to get 100% breed up. The cash cost to get per cow per year to breed that bull is about $24.28 per cow. That's his cash cost to cover that cow. How many of y'all have ever put it in that terms and thought about what is it costing you to keep that bull on your pasture and to keep him out there and breed him to the cows and the number of cows you're breeding to? Of course, the, the more cows I can breed him to, the more I spread those fixed and variable costs across and cheapen up that cost. Let's look at bull number two. So he's what I call one of our integrity beef bulls. So he's a high quality bull that we express uh, genetic potential on for weaning weight and yearling weight. Uh, in, to be an integrity beef, the producer, the producer has to buy a bull that's in the top 20%, both for weaning weight and yearling weight. So we're buying this bull from a reputable breeder. He has individual performance information. We have information on EPD. So because he's a little bit better bull, we've got to pay more for him. So instead of $2,500, I'm going to assign about a $4,500 cost to this bull. And because he's a little better bull, I'm going to say he's going to salvage out about 150 pounds heavier than that average run of the mill bull that I bought from my neighbor. <coughs> We're gonna use that same arbitrary 80 cents. That gives us a salvage value about $1,584. Using that same math we did a while ago, cost that bull over a five year lifespan is about $583.20. Now, we spent more to buy that bull, so I'm, I'm gonna assume that we spend a little bit more on keeping that bull around. So if we spend a little more on him, we're gonna baby him maybe a little bit more, feed him a little bit more, maybe go get him breeding soundness exam, whatever. So instead of charging 400, I said 500 dollars. So I'm dinging him a little bit more here. We've spent more to buy him, and we're going to spend more to keep him around. So total cash cost per year, taking that 583 plus 500, 1,083 dollars for that bull on an annual basis. Still going to breed him to the same 25 cows. Now his cash cost per cow to breed is 43 dollars. Does it look like a bargain? So if we look at him, <coughs> bull number two cost us $19 a head more to expose to those same 25 cows. That's a disadvantage, isn't it? But what is that better bull going to do for you? So if we take bull number one, we wean off 520 pounds. And like I said, these are real world numbers that I've gotten from my producers over time working with them uh, for 13 years. <coughs> like I said, we can argue what the sale price is. We can change that to you know, whatever the current market is. But keep in account the magnitudes are still going to be about the same. So the value of this calf at $1.43 weighing 520 pounds that we sell right off the cow. And I'm not taking into account that we're going to discount a weaned calf. This is just assuming you know, that the calf is selling right off the cow and what the market is going to give for that 520 pound calf. <coughs> and that calf's worth about $750. Bull number two's calf, because he weighs more, 63 pounds, 65 pounds more, that value of that calf is $818. Now, let's subtract out that $19 additional cost of breeding that better bull. Because a while ago we took into account what it cost us on a per cow basis. But now we're at the adjusted value of that calf is 700 and let's just call it $800 versus $750. The difference is $44 per head. We put that on 25 animals per year. That's $1,100 a year. And then we put it over a five year lifespan. That, that better quality bull because we are paying attention to our performance characteristics. That better quality bull is going to net the producer, after expenses, about $5,500 more in value of the calf. So that means that that producer can go and, and take that $2,500 he's been spending, add that to that $5,500, and that's realistically what he can afford to spend on a bull to buy before he reaches his, his break-even value. So about $8,000 is what he can afford to spend on a bull before he reaches a break-even of what he was doing previously. 
Anything that he spends less on that is money that goes in his pocket that he gets to keep. What if we take that calf to backgrounding all the way through a preconditioning phase? <clears throat> so 45 or 60 days. So we get to a little heavier weight. So of course he's worth less on a, on a per weight basis. We reflect that here. We still take into account that that bull number two has a higher breeding cost. We run through all the same math and we get down here and bull number two over a five year lifespan is gonna net that producer an additional $12,000 more after you take into account the cost of the bull. That's pretty substantial. So I show you all that, not to sell you on trying to buy better bulls, but I show you that to show that if you concentrate your genetics and your breeding programs on the different traits and improve those traits, that it's not only gonna make your producers that you sell your bulls to, your cows to, more money, but if they're making more money, where are they gonna come back and buy their next animal? They're gonna come back to you. <coughs> Likewise, if they're not making more money, are they likely to come back to you or are they gonna try somebody else down the road because somebody else may be doing those things that you should be? So think about that aspect. <coughs> now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about your dollar M and dollar T traits, your indices that y'all develop. So the dollar M is your maternal index and it focuses on these EPDs, weaning weight, urine weight, and milk, scrotal circumference. So, and you're balancing those traits, the weaning weight and urine weight, against the cow maintenance cost as a factor of mature cow size and milk production. And then you're trying to put a little bit of selection pressure on fertility of the heifer through scrotal circumference. And remember, the only thing that scrotal circumference indicates is that age of heifer when she reaches puberty for the first time. After that, scrotal circumference doesn't have any impact on the fertility of that cow moving into the future. Your terminal T index is based on the weaning weight, urine weight, ribeye, and IMF for your fat scores. And then also you're balancing that against the historical values of choice and select spread, as well as your yield grade pricing. And that's how y'all are developing your, your index. So one of the things I want you to keep in mind is there's been research that's shown that a weaning the calf is five times more important than anything else that we can do. Growth is more important than carcass by about a factor of two to three. Because if that calf doesn't grow out, it doesn't matter how well he, he grades if he's a small carcass on the rail. So a cow's ability to bring a calf to the weaning pen or her reproductive performance is directly related to how well she fits into your environment. You all have got a very good maternal breed, a cow that can very successfully work in most environments, and she can do that. My personal opinion, this is Robert Wells' opinion, is that your dollar M value needs to have a little more focus on reproduction. You're trying to get to that through your scrotal circumference, but that's not as good of an estimate as you can do. I think if you looked in and actually put in a value of something like heifer stability or, or heifer pregnancy or stability into that EPD trait, first off, you've got to collect that information and develop that EPD. If you all did that, and then y'all factor that into a dollar M, that you would have a much stronger case to be able to say that y'all have a great maternal characteristic breed that you can move the producer down the road. So here's some of my additional thoughts. So indices allow for factoring in economics into the equation, and that's great. Now one thing you have to keep in mind is that those indices have to stay current with the markets. And so what that means is if you're in an inclining market, that's great, if the indices were developed in that inclining market, then they're applicable. But we all know the cattle industry goes through cycles. And if our indice was built on an inclining market, but we're in a declining market, then our indice doesn't have a lot of validity to it. And so that, that indice needs to stay current and needs to be able to adjust. So it has to be a rolling trait. And, our, and most indices are doing that. Uh, so it also helps you balance your traits to look at the bigger picture item. And basically, indices are building the better mousetrap is what we're trying to do. It's also trying to make things a little more simple for that commercial cowman so that they can understand and take all those traits and boil down to one number. They can understand one number and they have to start lever leveling weaning weight versus yearling weight versus cavities versus marbling. Then they've got it, it takes a lot more skill to be able to do that. Make sure, but make sure your goals line up with the goals of the dollar index that you're looking at. And what I mean by that is that dollar T is designed for a producer that's gonna retain ownership through the feedlot and sell on a grid basis. <coughs> so think about that. It's designed for a producer that's gonna retain ownership and sell on a grid basis. 
So if you are selling your calf any time before that, that dollar T is going to capture some of the traits, but not all of them. So you've got to think about how do you use that dollar T. If you're selling right off the cow, then weaning weight is probably the only EPD that's applicable. Likewise, the dollar M is developing or emphasizes maternal traits. If it's a terminal operation, they shouldn't even regard or pay any attention to that dollar M because that animal is designed, should be designed, to go straight to the feedlot. And the maternal traits shouldn't matter as much. <coughs> so we need to understand how that index is built and what weights are placed on each EPD that's factored in. And the reason I say that is because we can have, both those traits have multiple EPDs that are built into it. So you can have, a, say, a curved bender bull that's really high on weaning weight or yearling weight and maybe less or low, very, very low in IMF. Because he's maybe the top trait leader for weaning weight, he can arbitrarily pull that indice up even though he's really, really low in our IMF. So you have to pay attention. When I tell people is if you use a dollar indice, still pay attention to your, your actual EPDs that went into that trait. So that way you can understand, is this bull truly a high dollar value animal because he's balanced across all the EPDs that went into that, e that trait or that indice? Or is he a high ranked indice animal because he ranked high in one or two animal, uh, one or two traits and he could be basic bargain basement low on the other traits? So you gotta pay attention, in my opinion, to all the EPDs that were built into that trait. You gotta understand that an animal can be high performing and they can artificially influence that one trait is what I was just talking about. Make sure that all traits that are high are meaningful to you. So if we have that dollar indice that's high in a certain thing, and maybe he's low in IMF, but you always sell your calf right after preconditioning, not that it's good for the industry, but okay, how much characteristics should you put on that IMF? Well, probably not as much. But if he's got a high dollar indice for that characteristic, okay, then you've done a good job of making sure that you're meeting the goals of what you need to shoot for. So think about into the future. Uh, my thought is that heifer pregnancy, you know, the ability to get ahead a, bread, a heifer bred sooner. And because beef masters have a high percent Brahma influence, Brahmas are a larger frame, later maturing animal. So having that heifer pregnancy characteristic will allow you all to start selecting for females that are a little bit more mature, uh, fertile at a, at a younger age. And I think that'll help move you all a little bit further forward. Stability, likewise. So it's the ability to stay bred and stay in the herd for a longer period of time. One calf per year and also structurally sound. So stability, I think, has a high applicability for your, industry, your breed. And then a measure of, eff of efficiency. And whether or not you pick RFI, average daily gain, dry matter intake, or some other measure of efficiency, that's up for y'all to decide what works best for your breed. But I think having some sort of measure of efficiency in there to be able to allow that commercial cattle producer, that commercial cowman that you're gonna sell those bulls and those females to, to have a high degree of, or of reliability uh, that they're buying an animal that's gonna be efficient. That's where our industry is moving into, is making sure that we're not only we're producing high quality beef consistently, but we're producing an animal that is most efficient as possible. As the input costs go up in the feedlot, corn prices go up. Corn drives everything else, byproducts, milo, anything else. As our input prices go up in the feedlot, that efficiency measure becomes more and more important to them. We need to make sure we have animals that can convert successfully. The ability to stay in the, so also that's the ability of the animal to stay in the herd and be efficient while it's doing it. It's either gonna eat less than we expect or it's gonna gain more on the same amount of forage or feed that we put out there. And also we need to think about efficiency on the forage. How well does that cow stay on the, in the herd? Is she an easy keeping cow or is she one of those that's hard doing? So this is a, one of those slides that's designed to make y'all think. So the six essentials, I guarantee every one of y'all can quote that in your sleep, that the beef master breed was built around weight, conformation, milk production, fertility, hardiness, and disposition. The last three I put in yellow. What's the EPDs y'all use to measure those last three? If it's important enough to the beef master breed to still maintain your goal of hitting these six essentials, you ought to be measuring those. If you're going to hang your hat on those six essentials, and this is what you're going to go out into the industry, and you're going to say, this is what beef masters are about, 
You need to be able to have something that you can hang your hat on and say, this is how we measure those traits. So that's something for you I think you all to think about as you move forward. you have got a great breed. You need to be able to justify it and prove it. Everybody knows that you have a great breed. I'll tell people that you have the fertility. I'll tell these people that I know that those beef masters can work in some pretty harsh environments. They were developed in those harsh environments. But how do we, how do we quantify that? Remember, there's a lot of other producers out there of other breeds that are willing to take shots at you. So you've got to be able to quantify. <clears throat> and this position, a producer that's never been around a beef master cow, if you tell that producer what are the three breeds that are made up of a beef master, you know, what's the highest percent breed that's made up of a beef master? Brahmin influence. What's the perception of a Brahmin animal? Crazy, wild, hard working. I grew up in South Texas with pure with purebred Brahmas. And I can tell you that we selected extremely hard on disposition. And I can tell you that we didn't have a cow on our place that would eat your lunch, even if we were going out there and tagging at birth. So I know we can have cattle that have good disposition. But the perception of the industry is this is a breed that is heavily influenced on Brahman. They must be crazier in a animal in a So we need to quantify some of these things so that way you can take out that perception that the industry is unfairly hanging on your breed. This is a great ad, and I remember coming about five years ago, I think it was, or now about three years ago, to a, uh, do a program for Bill in North Texas for a group of cattlemen that came up from Brazil, if I remember right. And this was an ad that was out there at the time. It said, because commercial cattlemen still sell market cattle on the pound basis. This is true, but in my opinion, this ad is outdated. We still sell cattle on a, mark, on a pound basis, but there's a reputation that's behind those cattle. And it's never been so more apparent to me than in the last year. In our Integrity Beef Alliance that I'm the director of, we've developed a, a marketing alliance from Integrity Beef Cow Calf Producers to a feedlot in Kansas, to a packing plant, and ultimately to McDonald's. And they're taking all of our grind and we're, and we're marketing through McDonald's chain. We're getting information fed back through every one of those stakeholders in the industry back to the cow calf producer. I just had a conversation earlier this week with the order buyer for that feedlot, and he asked me, he said, I'm not getting a lot of this, uh, the same amount of information that y'all got from a producer level, how the cattle performed at the feedlot on quality grade and yield grade, all those things. He said, man, if I had that, I could, do, I could probably bid your cattle up some. Likewise, it's a double-edged sword. If the cattle don't perform as well in the feedlot, that could hurt you. But we're in a situation, we're in an industry now where we're still selling on a pound basis, but there's a lot more that goes into that pound basis now. There's that perceived reputation of what the producer is able to provide to that order buyer. That order buyer, he's an independent contractor to every feedlot he works with. And so he's got a scorecard, if he likes it or not, that that feedlot scores him on. If he sends too many cattle that don't perform well or don't, don't convert, that feedlot will find another order buyer. So he's got he's to do his best due diligence of finding the cattle that are going to make him look good to that feedlot. If we have that information behind those animals, he's willing to bid those cattle up because it gives him that confidence that he's going to keep his job for another month or at least another year because he put the right cattle into that feedlot for him. And finally, one last thing to make y'all think about, this is my pet peeve and it's not beef master exclusive it's about every bull cell that i have ever gone to and my my pet peeve is just because you can doesn't mean you should and i know why we do it because you can sell a bull that is intact that has both testicles for more than we can sell that market feeder steer but why are we selling low genetic quality bulls in a reputation program what i mean by that is especially bulls that are in what i say in the lowest quartile for an economically relevant trait. An example I use is, let's say a buyer who doesn't understand EPD percentiles. And so he goes out there and he thinks he's buying a bull that's really good in a, in a particular trait. And he looks at it and he realizes, figures out that bull's the 95th percentile. And he buys that bull and he doesn't understand that 95th percentile means that 95% of, of the breed is better in that trait than he is. Just think about our school grading system. If I score a 95 on a test, I did pretty good, didn't I? 
If I score 100, I got everything right. But the way we do our percentiles is exactly opposite. 100% means that every animal that is in that characteristic is ranked better than him, basically. A top 1% means he's valedictorian in the class. But, so we have animals that we sell that are 95% or even 75% of that lowest quartile for trade that's economically relevant. Why do we do that? Because what happens is that guy that buys that animal doesn't understand what he bought. He just looks at him and thinks, man, that's a nice looking bull, and he buys that animal. He takes him home, he breeds him to a bunch of cows, he gets calves on the ground, hopefully unassisted. Worst thing would be he buys one that's 95th percentile for cavities or birth weight, and he has a lot of problems. But if he buys that animal, what, and he gets him home, and it doesn't perform to your expectation, you've hurt your ranch reputation, you've hurt your breed reputation, you've hurt the industry. And if you've hurt your ranch reputation so much, is he going to come back and buy cattle from you in the future? Probably not. And the worst part about that is, you know, the old saying is good news travels slow, bad news travels fast. He's going to go down to the feed store, he's going to go down to the coffee shop, and he's the local expert on that particular breed and that particular ranch that he bought off of, that bull from. <clears throat> and he's going to tell all his buddies and anybody within earshot of how badly that animal performed. So not only have you ruined your chance to sell another bull to that individual, but he's told how many other people. And those people might be a little more cautious about coming to your operation or buying your breed. So my opinion is if they're in the lowest quartile for an economically relevant trait, and if we're measuring an EPD, that's probably an economically relevant trait, then why are we selling them as breeding stock? And that's just my pet peeve as I go to a sale and I, and I, cause I hear when I'm sitting in the, in those bleacher stands or in those chairs, people talking and even my producers, I have to take the time to educate them as to no, 95th percentile is not good. 5% is really good. And that's where we need to be. So with that, there's my phone number and my email. So if you want to call and chew me out later, I'll be on a flight at 7:30 tonight. Uh, but you can catch me after that or send me any sort of email you'd like saying that I'm wrong. Uh, or if you want to tell me that you agreed with what I had to say, I'd be glad to take some questions. Oh, surely somebody's got a good question for me. Yes, sir. So yeah, you got to remember that those tra those dollar traits, there's a lot of EPDs that go into that, and so you have to think about how, you know, if he's really really high, curve bender, or he's really really low, that that's going to drag that index one way or the other, and so you got to look at that, and, and that's why I say you really need to look at all the EPDs and understand what goes into those dollar indices to understand you know where that bull really is, because if he's really really high curve bender in there, you know but he's you know, really low in something. Or let's just say he's you know, average in a lot of the trades, but he's really low in one trade. He can pull him down arbitrarily. Yes, sir. So where, the question is, where can you go to best fine tune your indexes? Uh, so are you asking like what other traits should you care to put into that index or? I would say on the maternal, uh, uh, to add to that, not only fertility, but also uh, I would look at, because you have weaning weight, and I believe urine weight in that dollar M, uh, you probably need to look at cow size. Uh, because you're, being that you do have dollar, or your weaning weights and urine weights in there, that's a selection trait pushing for a larger, you know, a heavier growing calf, more rapidly growing calf, and there's a direct correlation to a rapidly growing calf, a mature cow size. So if you don't put some downward selection pressure on mature weight of that cow, you're going to get in the same situation that the Angus are in. And the reason I say that is if you look at the data, the last, last time I looked at the data, the average Angus cow out there was larger than the average Charlotte cow. And that's because they've really pushed on those, those growth traits. If we don't put some downward selection pressure on mature cow size, it can get out of hand. Also, if you're looking at your dollar M, or, or excuse me, your milking ability, uh, we can get a cow that's a really heavy milker, and that can influence some of those other traits. We can get into a high weaning weight and whatnot, and that can also 
push that dollar in. That answers the kind of the question where you were asking, or you look at a different direction. A source to help. I would say the geneticist that y'all got it. He's very good. Uh, the thing is, is he's got to have the data, the information to work with. And so, if y'all aren't collecting the information he needs to be able to develop those dollar traits, then he's limited in what he can do. Now, I'm not going to suggest that you go and get 20 EPDs that measure everything under God's green earth, and, you know, and measure switch length. You know, there's a, there's a an extent of where you can measure EPDs. And there's an extent of what the producer, the commercial producer, is willing to try to digest. So you can over, overdo it. But you know, I think there are some EPDs that y'all could add to it. Uh, but that your geneticist, he's got to be able to have that information to work with. Yes, sir, in the back. Sure, and that's a good question. So the question was, how do you quantify those three traits of a, that I had highlighted there at the end? Uh, so th that's a real good question. So uh, disposition, I'll tackle that one. That, that, that's probably the easiest one. You're, like you said, you're already working on some, some, uh, you know, the fertility things. Uh, so I think y'all are y'all are already moving down the right road in that direction. We just need to get to that 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 uh, publishable public endpoint. Uh, <clears throat> hardiness, uh, you know, there are DNA traits that they've identified uh, that has a direct correlation so we can build off of some of the work that some of the other breed associations have done. Now that means we also need to validate it for your breed, but I think that's easy enough to do. Uh, you know, if you look at the trainer data sets for, for DNA, uh, those trainer data sets don't have to be that large, relatively speaking, uh, and then you proof it with another, another set that that validates that information. So there's already been some of that information or that work that's already been done. You know, the ruts have been cut in other breeds. Uh, there's an opportunity there, I think, you know, visit with your genetic providers of seeing if those traits are trans, you know, translatable over into the beef master. And I would think that there would be a high degree or some relative confidence that you could do that. The other thing is, is, is uh, you know, like I said, it doesn't take a huge data set of having trainer animals to develop an EPD. Uh, so maybe it is something you get with some of your leading producers, your larger producers that can put together those large numbers and you do some of those things to develop those disposition characteristics. Uh, you know, I, I'm not the best one to answer, answer that question I, on what is the traits to use. Uh, my, one of my thoughts is, you know, we've got an industry great that's at Colorado State in the, in the form of Temple Grandin and visit with her and see what they have. Uh, what, she, what her suggestions are. Uh, you've got a guy in the back over here, that uh, Robert Williams, that uh, probably could add, add a lot to this discussion, I would say. Uh, so yeah, you've got people that are better trained and educated when it comes to the genetic side of that that can help you to identify those traits there. Hardiness, that's the hard one. That's the tough one. I would say hardiness, one of the things I would look at is stability. Uh, because when I look at hardiness, I'm thinking of, you know, you know, you know, a cow that can stay in my environment and work in my environment. So stability is one way to do that. Now, one of the things I'd like to look at when I look at stability is that most breed associations that are using stability, they're only looking to the year four or year five. Well, to me, that's right when the cow's finally getting in her prime. You know, for, for a breed like y'all that we know that you can have cows that can stay around longer than the average, that's where I think y'all can hang your hat, is looking at, you know, how much further can we go? You know, it's like, you know, the example I'll use is, is I bought a new pickup last year, and I think that pickup's got a 36,000 mile warranty on it. I know that truck's gonna last longer than 30, well, I hope it lasts longer than 36,000 miles, I'll still be paying on it. But, you know, that if I only have my hardiness estimate that goes to four years, it's like having a, a warranty that only goes to 36,000 miles. 
if I have a hardiness estimate that goes to eight years, let's say, that I've developed that confidence with the producer that my animal's gonna stick around longer. If I can get in a vehicle that has a 100,000 mile warranty on it versus that 36,000 mile warranty, which one do you have more confidence in when you're making that big investment purchase on it? So stability, I think, would be a good, a good easy, low-hanging fruit to do that. There's probably some other estimates out there that we could use. Maybe looking at, you know, like um, Herford uses teat score. Uh, you know, we all know that a cow, as she gets older, that bag wears out, and those teats get bigger, and the suspensory ligaments get lower, and it makes it harder. How many of y'all have told a cow based upon the fact that she has a bad bag? Probably everybody in this room. So I think you're, you're doing some of those things already that you can factor in and maybe build a hardiness type estimate. Uh, whether you call it hardiness or something else, I would say you probably would want to since that's one of your six essentials. But I think there's some things that you might be able to do uh, you know, to be able to answer some of those questions, to be able to, you know, to get at the fact that you are collecting the measurements on every one of those six essentials that y'all hang your hats on. Yes, sir. So that's a great question. The question was whether or not hardiness EPD needs to be geographically related. I would say no. And the reason I would say that is the goal of any EPD is that we get enough large enough value of numbers of the data set that it starts to kind of wash out. It's no different than weaning weight or urine weight or milk EPD. You know, it's, it's, you know, we get a large enough data set there that it starts to account for all those factors there. Exactly. Great questions. Jerlyn or Colin, how are we doing on time? And I'll be around for a few minutes. I've got to uh, probably leave out of here by 5.30 so I can catch my flight. Uh, but I'll be around for a few minutes to visit with anybody that would like to. I appreciate y'all's time. Uh, y'all are a great crowd and y'all asked some really good questions. But, and I want y'all to you know, appreciate everything that y'all do as beef master breeders. I've got a great breed, uh, but every breed has room that they can you know, continue to work toward because the thing is, you remember that if you don't, your competition is. And they're all, all the other breeds are continually striving to move forward and push that needle forward. And so everybody has to do that. And so I've got a great breed and y'all doing a lot of good things. But I think there's you know, a couple of things I mentioned there at the end, I think will just make them that much better. And they'll be, be able to hang your hat on what y'all are. Appreciate it. Thank you all.